From John chapter 28, verse 30, we read, Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. When the Samaritan woman met Jesus at the well, she discovered a hopeful future with new possibilities. And her first instinct was to go back to her city, tell others about her experience, and invite them to come and see. By doing that, she helped usher in a new future for her family and community too. When we spiritually connect to Jesus Christ and his community of disciples, our future becomes more than just an extension of our past. New perspectives, possibilities, and networks of relationships emerge that alter the quality, direction, and priorities of our lives. I especially am fascinated by the meaning of the last sentence of the scripture passage from John. When people in the city heard the Samaritan woman's witness of Jesus Christ, quote, they left the city and were on their way to him. They began traveling with hopeful intent. They began dramatically reorienting their lives toward Jesus. They became thirsty thirsty to discover him, the gift of living water, and to be part of his community of disciples. We can approach this verse two ways. First, it is a statement of fact. Some of them physically left their homes and shops to journey with Jesus wherever he was going. This is reminiscent of the fishermen who immediately dropped their nets, left their boats, and followed him in response to some mysterious inner spiritual urging. But second, this verse can be understood as a statement of spiritual intent. The people from the city began spiritually awakening and moving spiritually toward Jesus as the hope and focus of their lives. With that perspective, broader application becomes possible and some provocative questions emerge. What is the spiritual attitude trajectory and focus of our lives? Are we enthusiastically on our way to Jesus in the priorities, character, and vision of our discipleship? As community of Christ, are we listening and moving together toward Jesus in our relationships and concerns? Like others, I've studied the Gospels and related works. And as far as I can tell, the real Jesus, the one we claim to follow, does not always prevail in our daily choices, interactions, and priorities. Many embrace Jesus Christ in their desires for personal salvation, protection, and well-being. At the same time, it is not unusual for many to excuse themselves from Jesus' 
teachings, when he insists that we live in compassionate and generous lives in inclusive community as an indication of our love of God, neighbor, and enemy. In my message last Sunday, I noted that the Samaritan woman came to the well at an odd time. Most came early in the morning or at the end of the day. She came midday. I suspect she came then to avoid the scorn of others. However, after her living water encounter with Jesus, she left her water jar beside the well, rushed back to her community, and urged others to venture out to meet Jesus too. That certainly is a dramatic change in self-perception, priorities, and valuing of relationships. Remarkably, the ridiculed woman at the well became the source of living water for many Samaritans. The love, message, and embrace of Jesus Christ are broad beyond measure. By their very nature, they must be shared widely or they're not being shared at all. They are not limited to just me, my kind of people, or some preferred nation, culture, or race. If we truly are moving toward and with Jesus, then the church constantly will venture beyond all kinds of perceived boundaries and horizons to invite others to drink deeply of Christ's life-giving water in loving community. If we as community of Christ truly are on our way to him, then Jesus' passions and concerns, as stated in Doctrine and Covenants 164, 9d, will visibly be our passions and concerns. Any gaps between our views and his vision will be resolved as we move toward him, not by trying to conform him to us. That's what it means to be on our way to him. It is ongoing personal and communal spiritual transformation in Christ as a lifelong adventure. When 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 states, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, everything old has passed away. It is talking about much more than personal salvation. It is proclaiming that if we truly are living and moving in Christ, we are becoming a new kind of human being within a new kind of of humanity. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 further illuminates this truth by describing the ultimate work of Christ to quote create in himself one new humanity thus making peace. Some authors conclude Jesus was the forerunner of a new, emerging, peaceful humanity. They emphasize Jesus' peaceful manner and teachings. 
Even when he experienced persecution and violence by crucifixion, he stayed true to his peaceful nature without returning violence for violence. His steadfastness on the cross as he suffered horrible violence reveals the truth that our common redemption and calling in Christ is to be peaceful humanity. What if baptisms, confirmations, and observances of the Lord's Supper in community of Christ emphasize that calling in addition to conventional meanings? How might we think, speak, and interact differently as disciples of Christ, the peaceful one. Scripture testifies that all creation waits with eager longing for peaceful humanity to appear on the world stage to turn the tide of hate, agony, and destruction. With that in mind, the central question raised by our text looms even larger. Are we moving toward Jesus, the peaceful one, or are we retreating from Jesus by reverting to our old humanity and its destructive ways of interacting with others and creation. As Barbara Brown Taylor observed, as long as we go on poisoning the planet of our birth and slaughtering one another, we still have a lot of transforming to do. As for this community of faith, I continue to feel the Holy Spirit urging us to go much deeper and further in exploring, embodying, and sharing the peace of Jesus Christ in all the locations and vocations of our lives. As we do, we will discover the essential meaning of restoration. We will discover our best selves and brightest future. We will discover all the surprising ways that Christ-inspired community weaves diverse people together as expression of the gospel of peace. And we will discover deep community in Christ as a wellspring of living water rising and revealing the currents of God's grace flowing through our lives. Originally, I had intended to conclude my comments at that point. However, I want to share a few additional words with the conference. Several times during the World Conference, I have offered spoken messages through which perspective and guidance for the church has been presented. Throughout the week, I have experienced the prompting of the Holy Spirit indicating that it would be good to emphasize certain concepts as we embark upon the next phases of our faith adventure with God. I do not have any expectation regarding the ultimate 
status of what I will present to you now. If these words have enduring value for the church, they will find their place in the character, responses, and living canon of our lives. In response to the illumination of the Holy Spirit, I offer the following words. Beloved in Christ, for many years you longed for a temple to fulfill the hopes of generations. Now there is a temple seeking fulfillment through a worldwide community that embodies divine light, generosity, and peace. Being a people of the temple is a constant calling that finds creative expression through each generation. Your continuing response to the call to be a people of the temple is commendable and of eternal importance. When humans esteem themselves, each other, all interactions, and the entire creation as temple, peace prevails. This restoring vision and witness is entrusted to you. Financial constraints are hindering the church from moving into the future at a pivotal and opportune time in history. These obstacles can be overcome through generosity, cooperation, and discernment about how the assets of the church can be directed to serve budget necessities and mission priorities. Members, congregations, and church jurisdictions are called to live the stewardship principles and practices already given to you. Technology presents opportunity for involvement in sacraments by priesthood members and participants in separate locations. The First Presidency will act in its calling as chief interpreters of scripture, revelation, and church policies to provide procedures for offering sacraments in new situations while upholding essential meanings and symbols of the sacraments. As the church explores new opportunities for sharing sacraments, direction will come as needed through inspiration and wisdom. Additional meaning is waiting to be discovered in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Renewing covenant with Jesus Christ includes the call to live as peaceful human beings who personify Christ's peace. Spiritual blessing will be experienced when this call is emphasized as a vital aspect of the sacrament. Cherish opportunities to be spiritually formed by Christ's sacred meal of remembrance, reconciliation, renewal, and peace. Then, go with conviction into the locations of your discipleship and be 
the peace of Christ. As you do, you will discover a variety of ways in which spiritual community forms and flows as expressions of the gospel of peace. Trust what is being born. Have faith in divine purposes. Persist in hope. Amen.